Hello, and welcome to a very special 8-minute demo video series. Today, we're going through a video tutorial on OIS 6.3 Advanced Workflow Design and Best Practice Video Shorts. Yep, these are going to be smaller videos on specific topics. And the topic we're going to talk about right now is multi-value data handling, including flattening and other options. We're going to take a look at multi-value data handling. So there's a couple different ways you could handle multi-value data, but let's first look at what multi-value data is. It most often comes from objects like query database or read line, PowerShell objects that generate uh, arrays, anything where you're dealing with one query or ask for information and then it results in an array of data. And a good example, of course, is our query database object and we're going to pull computer name and priority from a computers table here and we'll be able to see in the testing console what multi-value data looks like, the key indicators of if you have uh, multi-value data. And we're just going to hit run. Of course it returned. And when you see the ellipsis in any of these fields, and it can happen depending on which object you're using, uh, but most often in this object it's going to be full line as string with field separated by semicolon. And if you, oh, we open this up, we could see we have multiple lines. And you could see you could individually click. These are individual objects. And a lot of times, you want to actually use those objects to do something. Like you, we returned 27 or 28 computers, and now we want to go do something on those 27, 28 computers. And that's you know common. And all we'd have to do is put a run program over here, and then identify the computer. And the command, we could do we can do an IP config on all of them, finish, and if we wrote all that data out to the platform event. In fact we could even make this more dynamic since we're all about making things dynamic, right? So the program path and then the pure output. Now if we check this in, as you might imagine, this is going to execute once. This will execute the number of times that the multi-value data was produced. And then, of course, this will execute the amount of times that this executed. I'm going to start this up. And in no time, we should see some events. And I'm actually going to clear these events out so we have uh, a clean palette. OK, we can see we have some events here with information. Of course, we, it parsed the information as we wanted to. IP config for a palace. And you can see that it got the IP config information for that machine, the VMM, SQL, so on and so forth. So um, that's what we would expect. And this is proper handling of multi-value data because it did exactly what we wanted to do. So how do we handle it when we don't want to have all of the data individually executed for every object on the line. Well, now we're going to get into the exceptions for multi-value data handling, and one of them is to use the flatten functionality. So if I have a folder here for flatten example, and we're using a different object here, just the run.net script object, and we're using PowerShell, and we're doing a simple git process, and we're going to output that test variable. So let's first run through the testing console. All right, we're just going to run this, and we'll, there's that the ellipsis there in the output, and you can see in the output we have various items. But let's say I just wanted to get processes from a machine and then dump it in to a email, which we'll represent here with the send platform event. But I don't want to send, you know, as many emails as there are processes. I want to actually just send one. So we could certainly set this up, and this is process information and subscribe publish data to the output but if I ran this right now we'd get as many send platform events as we have processes so let's do the flatten we open this up go to run behavior now there's an option for flatten now we have some other options for the flatten if you want to separate it with some sort of delimiter which defaults to comma you can use semicolon, you can use anything you want. If you're going to use this and you're going to parse it out later, I recommend using a delimiter that's probably never going to be used in any of the data you're going to be uh, sifting through. So I'm, I use pound pound delim pound pound and that way I know exactly what to parse out later. And if you wanted to, you could even subscribe to a variable there so you could put this as a variable and then reuse it as necessary. 
But in lieu of that, uh, for this example, if I'm just sending an email or an event, I just probably want to separate it with line breaks. Just check this in and run it, and then the next event here will have that information. And there it is, process information. And you can see that it concatenated all the bits of data into one string and put the line feed characters between each one. Now likewise, if we wanted to do something different, like that pound pound, delim pound pound, hit finish, we're still only going to get one execution, but the data is going to look very different, as you can imagine. And now it's much more difficult to read, but you can see there's delimiters between each one of these, and you could obviously use some sort of split function, field function, to extract the information if you wanted to. And then again, and I just want to show you, that's one of the reasons why I usually use line breaks when I use flatten, because most of the use cases I have for flatten are to actually send notifications on large groups of data. Now, when you separate with a delimiter or a use CSV format, that's common when you're trying to pass data through the workflow and not have subsequent objects execute multiple times, and then you can expand that data later on in the workflow. So if we did this and something less obnoxious, we'll do semicolons because I know it's not in the data for the process. And then this guy will execute once, and then we can get the information out as needed and maybe we use one of these objects to parse the data back out and expand it essentially. So if we go ahead and open this up, change this to C sharp, and I'm going to drop some code in here. All right, and then I want to change this obviously to publish data. It's going to be coming from the object that we flattened. So the output there. And then we need to add a namespace. And of course we need to add an output. And it's going to be a collection. So variable name, collection, and this will be multi-value results. All right. So essentially what this code is going to do is it's going to take in the concatenated um, output, which is in the delimiter will be semicolon. You could change that up if you wanted to. And then it's going to look at the length. It's going to set the length, and then it's going to do a for loop, and then add each of the results that you see there into a collection, and then output that collection as multi-value data. Now to really test this, I'm going to put another send platform event. And this is going to be, I'm going to change these up. This is going to be flattened. And I'm going to change this to expanded. And instead of putting something generic in the summary, I'll actually get the data from the multi-value results. So essentially what this is going to do, this is going to generate multi-value data, but flatten it. This is going to result in the flattened output with a semicolon. If we check out the properties and go to run behavior, we're doing semicolon, if you remember that. And then I'm going to expand data using C sharp this time and using this bit of code. And then I'm going to show the expanded results by showing the multi-value data there. So I'm just going to check this in and run it and actually clear out the events so we can see what's going on and we'll hit start it's done so refresh and there we go if we scroll down you can see everything happened very quickly so here's the first flattened one so there's the process information with all the flattened information each of these other processes were expanded so let's check out the log history see what that looks like get process flattened it then we expose the flattened data and then we expanded the data, and you could see we expanded it there. So this is one way to flatten and then expand the data. This is a pretty common practice, and you can do it even if you had changed this to line breaks. All you would need to do is change the delimiters here to parse on the line break. Finish. I'll actually put a delay in here, too, so we could see the now everything's happening at once out the events again and hit start now it looks like it's done we refresh scroll all the way down 
there we go, process information, then there was that two second gap that we put in there. So here's all the process information. This time it's by line break. And then because we changed the delimiter that we're parsing on here to line breaks, we still get the expanded data. And obviously if we check log history, same story here. All right, so there's another way to handle multi-value data, and that is with the junction object. And we've seen this if you've watched the junction object uh, best practice video, and I'm just going to show this very quickly. So we have the query database object that's generating a bunch of stuff. I am not flattening. And then I have the junction object, which is set to none. And then we know that basically truncates all the published data. So on this side of the junction object, we can't access the published data from the query database, but we can say something's completed. And if we hit check in and run, and we go back to the events, we should get one event. And there it is. Query completed. doesn't have any data in it, but we know that the, it, we are notified that it is done. Now, obviously, if we didn't have this junction set to none and we actually sent it to the query database, then we could access that information, but it would be multi-value. So I'm going to purge this, check this in, start it, and then in a couple seconds, we'll get a bunch of events with the same summary, but different details. Let's see, there's many of the same summary, but each of them will have a different query result. So that's the junction object. Obviously, I did go through that in the junction um, tutorial, and we talked through different things on how to handle that. And if you wanted to actually pass information from before the junction object, where to get it from, and stuff like that. But using junction is valid for handling multi-value data. So one more topic I'd like to cover, and this hasn't been covered before on my blog and in fact I recently ran into this when someone asked me this question so I call this mismatch multi data output handling because you might have an object for example I just mocked this up for a previous example we have two arrays one array has four values and one array has seven values and we're publishing both of those in the same object on the data bus what happens well, I've set this up previously, so we're going to parse some stuff out. But let's take a look if I just generically have success on this route, success on that route. Send platform event, the top one is doing array one, and send platform event on the bottom is doing array two. I'm going to clear out the events. I'm going to check this in. I'm going to run it. You should expect that. Both of these objects are going to execute the maximum number of times of output from this object. So that's seven. You can see here, sort of by summary there, we have array one that executed seven times and array two that executed seven times. The problem is array one does not have seven values of data. It only has four. So there are some that are blank. But array two has all seven. So how do you deal with that? Well, for one thing, you have to know the rules. So I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. And then for the one that has more values, so we know in this case it is array 2, we don't have to do any filtering at all. We're good to go for that. It'll just output all of that data as necessary. But if we didn't want to output blank lines for the array 1, we could simply use a link filter just like we learned in the policy engine rules. For array 1, we do not match pattern where there's a null. Caret dollar. So in this link, nothing will pass if it's null. Hit finish, check that in, start it up, and now we can see we have four values for array 1 and seven values for array 2. So this is a it's a very simple example, but this is one way you could handle mismatched multi-value data output um, from one particular object. Just remember, those links can be very useful when you're trying to parse out nulls or parse out anything, but in this case we're doing nulls. 
And that has been the various ways you can handle multi-value data. You can actually use it to your advantage. You can flatten and expand. You could truncate. Or you can filter. Depends on what you want to do. So you can see there's lots of options. And I certainly hope this has helped you get a better understanding of multi-value data handling. We certainly appreciate you watching. Thank you.